Hi, hi. Thanks for uh, having me along. Um, there, there was so much in that previous talk that I agreed with, by the way. I mean, the, the, um, the, the point about focusing on emotion, uh, the, the distinction between content and, and story is something we've had a lot of debates about over at the BBC. We, we tried to craft a mission statement recently where we were trying to avoid saying the word content, but it just kept on coming back. It's so frustrating. Um, so I, I, I came here uh, today, uh, Lisa and, and Lindsay asked me to come along. Um, one of the reasons that um, I first got to know the Verve team was, was that they did some really great outreach to the BBC. Um, they, they were kind of working with, with commercial clients and they were telling us about the work they were, they were doing with them. And, that the, the, co the content, sorry, the stories they were creating were, were so good that we've ended up working with them directly to actually make some interactive. So, um, so yeah, th thank you for having us along. Like, I mean, if, if you want to know how, what good outreach looks like, I think you could take a cue from these guys. Um, so what, what I want to talk about today is the, the journalist's perspective. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a working journalist at the BBC and um, I, uh, Every day, I'm, I'm getting kind of pitches from uh, f from like uh, PRs, from journalists, from freelancers, uh, asking, like, will I take this story? So I just wanted to give it a, a view about what it's like on, on my side, um, and also like tell you a bit about how how we decide what a story is, like for, from a news perspective, but also from a features perspective. So th there are so many stories that we could do but we don't do them all. Um, here, this, this talk is about trying to define what we look for. So to start, I just wanted to introduce you to a, a guy who uh, was a big deal in the Edwardian period, Alfred Harmsworth, uh, AKA the, the Viscount Northcliffe. So he was a, a newspaper publisher uh, and he was the owner of the Daily Mail, the Mirror, and the Times. He, I think by 1914, he controlled something like 40% of the morning newspaper circulation in Britain, like 45% of the evening. So, like, eat your heart out, Rupert Murdoch, like Paul Dacre. I mean, it's uh, like quotes about him include like more than anyone, he shaped the modern press. That he was the greatest figure who ever strode down Fleet Street. He's, he was one of the earliest innovators of like popular journalism. So the journalism that we, we see today, he he kind of did it first. Uh, and he, he's also credited with doing things like introducing advertising revenue to subsidise prices. So, thanks for that, Alfred. Uh, he's um, uh, the reason that I'm, I was I'm interested in him though is, is he he's also sometimes credited with introducing a a piece of wisdom, something that, that like journalists still go to today, and it's the kind of thing that's like taught uh, in in journalism school. I mean, he he popularised the phrase. If a dog bites a man, that's not news. If a man bites a dog, that's news. Very simply, like this, this kind of defined for him what, what a story made uh, what was. Um, it's not entirely clear if he, he coined it or not. There's a lot of kind of uh, back and forth on the internet about whether he was the guy that came up with it. I mean, it's also been attributed to U US newspaper editors in the 18th century, but it, it may well be something that he helped to popularize. As I say, I, either way, like it's some, something that almost all journalists kind of know. Uh, if not, like, they know the phrase, they, they, will, they will apply it to their, their storytelling. So, given that, you can only imagine, like, how pleased I was a few months ago to see this new story. <laughs> a real man bites dog story. Like, can, can you imagine the day that that journalist had? Like, when he saw that story, it wrote it up, Dropped his mic, went home. I mean, it's like um, it had a, it had everything. I mean, the, the dog was not hurt, fortunately. Um, uh, it was a police dog, uh, as you as you can see from the quotes. Uh, there was a lieutenant, Jason Killery, of the New Hampshire Police Department. He said, "If you get into a biting competition with a police dog, you're not going to win. They're pretty good at that." And then he bit the dog. The dog bit him. He ended up getting tasered. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I was, I was pretty pleased when I saw this story because it kind of, it, I don't know, that, that, this, uh, um, this captures like something that I'd, I'd learned a long time ago. But as I was researching this talk, I, I thought I'd Google um, Man Bites Dog. And I found this. Like, since the beginning of the year, there's been like four separate stories of men buying dogs. It's, uh, 
It's fascinating. So like, there was one on BBC News, uh, two in Florida, and one with a parent ca council chairman. Um, so maybe the act is more common than journalists realise, uh, and maybe North, North Coast was wrong. Um, so a apart from men biting dogs, um, what else do news journalists look for in a story? I mean, this is just a snapshot. So um, there's a lot of things that, that make a story for a journalist, especially from a news perspective. Um, uh, I mean, salience, like uh, kind of importance, obviously, uh, timeliness, whether it's inspiring, uh, whether it's got conflict in it. I, I mean, these, I, I would argue, are pretty self-evident and uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail today about these because like many of you will be journalists in the room or no journalists and so you kind of have a good sense of like what what makes a, a new story what I'd like to to dive into today is, is a bit more about like what does a features journalist look for because and, and, and also look at like some of the more like non-obvious um, uh, things that a, a modern digital journalist uh, looks out for when, when a pitch uh, lands in their email inbox. Um, it, this is a bit less obvious because, I mean, features journalism is different in the sense that it's not just about one thing, it's, it, as in the, you're not going to base a whole feature around a single um, uh, kind of press release, you're not going to base a whole feature around, say, a, a finding in a, a scientific paper. It's, it, it needs to be kind of like bigger than that. You, you're looking for other elements, you're looking for, for story. So, news waves. Um, that, incidentally, I think is the squirrel from Anchorman, uh, if you recognize it. Like, uh, so um, this is uh, about the importance of timing. Um, and timing is and can be just as important as, as topic. Um, just to illustrate this point about the importance of timing um, and, and kind of like trying to kind of like hit stories that kind of are in the zeitgeist, um, I want to illustrate it with the, the, the Gartner hype cycle. So some of you will be like, familiar with this. This is, this is something that I'm kind of familiar with in my beat. I'm a, a technology journalist by background. So G Gartner every year put out this, this cycle which kind of um, shows, it, in terms of hype, where specific technologies are. So at the, at the start, you have the technology trigger, which is kind of basically like this has been found in a research lab. Um, so you have smart dust there, 4D printing, I've no idea what they are, but they sound great. Um, and what, what happens with it, a, a technology over time is that it gradually gets more and more hyped. So at the top, you have things like deep learning, machine learning, and, and artificial intelligence. So you'll, you'll no doubt have been reading a lot about AI in the news at the moment. AI, I, I'd say a, AI is definitely at the peak at the moment because lots of people are saying AI can solve everything. It's kind of hitting every industry. It's probably hit, hitting marketing as well. Uh, every kind of uh, industry is kind of bringing their hands about, w will AI replace jobs in, in my industry? Um, what, what Gartner um, point out, though, is, is about what happens in, in terms of the way a technology gets talked about is that it crashes straight after like peak hype into something called the trough of disillusionment. So um, after something has is, is reached a lot of kind of like coverage in the, in the, the press, like um, people get a bit sick of it, or they, they kind of come to realize that the promises that, that were delivered by the hype just haven't happened. So I think a good example of that is, is 3D printing. So a few years ago, The Economist were doing things like running cover features about a new industrial revolution, how 3D printing is gonna be in every home and change everything that we, that we do it hasn't kind of really come to pass. And so I'd say 3D printing is, is down in the bottom there at the moment. It's people are kind of like, haven't really kind of like taken it on. However, there's probably a pretty good chance that over time, 3D printing will come back and it, it, it will become a thing as people start to buy them, people start to see them in, in kind of um, uh, real settings and, and actually kind of like come to, to kind of like get their hands on, on that kind of thing. But it's gonna take a while. That this, um, this, this hype cycle, I, I, I think, has always, always interested me because I think it also can apply to, to journalism as well and, and this, the kinds of stories that we, that we choose to do. So back when I was at New Scientist, we came up with a, a variant on this, which we called the bathtub of death. <laughs> um, but basically, so, so what we found was with um, uh, the, the stories that we were cho choosing to do, 
um, that there was kind of like a moment when you could ride on, on a, something, we, we called it a news wave. So th there's, there's kind of like, just when things, are, things go in fashion. So cer certain subjects kind of like, you, you can kind of capture that news wave. People are talking about it, they're interested in it, um, it's, it's a moment for it. However, if you miss that moment, you end up in the bathtub of death. Um, it, it, and this, this was a, like a key thing for us in terms of like how we how we decided what we were going to cover. Um, I'd say again, into, just illustrate it from my beat. Um, there's there's a series of topics now that I regularly get pitches for in terms of content from both from journalists and, and uh, from the world of PR and marketing about that, that just. I know that the audience don't have an appetite for it anymore. So driverless cars, 3D printing, uh, virtual reality, uh, drones, all of these things were kind of quite sexy in terms of like uh, the, the, the kind of the interest in them uh, about a year ago. But they've kind of like, in terms of like the analytics, what we see from audiences, people have just had their fill. They, they, or, or put it this way, they, they need a new, a new way of like kind of like experiencing that story. So in the case of 3D printing, new 3D printing could influence X or 3D printing could do Y. That those basic stories, they're, they're gone now. Like if you have a, a subject like 3D printing, you need to tell a new story. But by definition, a story is something that someone hasn't heard before. Um, if, if, it's, if it's not uh, kind of novel, then it, people won't engage with it. And we find that time and again, um, in the analytics we see, like when we, when we put up stories, it doesn't mean that we don't do them because sometimes we, stories are important. Uh, uh, we have to kind of like cover what's happening in the world, but we're well aware now of what, what the audience reaction to, to kind of like certain topics are. The second thing I wanted to talk about, and this, this is something that has um, been I mean, to say it's, it's greatly influenced journalism is, 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 a, is a massive understatement. I mean, what, what Facebook has done to the way that journalism is practiced has been huge over the past few years. And it's, it's not just changed how journalists produce content for the platform, it's also changed journalism itself. People in newsrooms now think much more about like, how will my story be shared? Um, and it's, for better or worse, it, it, it has uh, uh, changed a lot in terms of the, uh, our practice. The, that might change with the algorithm change. So you, you may be familiar that Facebook is now downgrading uh, like news publishers. Um, however, there will always be a, a platform somewhere, I mean, in email, like where people will want to pass a story on to somebody else. So, that, that in terms of storytelling, that's what we think about. Um, not just um, how will it play well if we put it on our Facebook kind of page, but more crucially, are we doing stories that people want to tell other people about? So storytelling is, is a form of social currency. Um, it, it's uh, the definition of a good story is something that you, you get home at the end of the day and you tell your partner or you go down the pub and you tell your friends. Like, I, I often, that's a, an acid test for me. Like, will my wife, who is an English teacher, be interested in, in this, this kind of science story that I'm doing? If she isn't, then I know that like, I need to do more work on that story to kind of like, capture her interest. BuzzFeed did, uh, talked about this a few years ago. Um, uh, there was a, a BuzzFeed editor who, who kind of, uh, pointed out that there were, there were certain sharing principles, like things that, that define what, um, what, why a story will be shared. Because um, I, think, I think there is a crucial distinction, because if you think about your own media diet, there's, there's kind of stories that are kind of just pure information, and then there's stories that you will pass on to somebody. So the day's political news, maybe just that's, that's a pure piece of information, you digest it, and it's a kind of digest only uh, uh, kind of story, but then there's also kind of like stories that are digest and share, and I, I think that's something that I think is a distinction that is, is worth thinking about when you're producing uh, content. Um, one of the, the the ways of thinking that is it's through through identity. So 
people's uh, reasons to share are often based on kind of like the, the identity that they want to project to other people um, in their social network. So this expresses my identity better than I can myself. It can also be an, like an emotional gift. As I say, it's, it's social currency, like uh, sharing a story. So this made me feel X. I would like you to feel, feel Y. Um, it's, it can also be something about what you believe, so social information. Here, here is something that supports a view that I already have. Stories allow us to express our kind of like desired identity, I think, and to show others like, I have a sense of humor, or I'm thinking of others, or I'm, I'm cultured, I'm smart. So I, I think uh, thinking about like when you're producing something, what is the, the reason that someone would pass it on to somebody else? I think that's, that's really important. I just also wanted to talk about story narrative as well. Uh, this, is, this is something that doesn't apply to all features and, and to, to all news, but um, it does apply to some of the best ones. So good, good stories take you on a journey. They have like a beginning, a middle, and an end. They, they've got characters, they've got setbacks. There's, there's also like elements of quest in them. And they're, they're more than like overviews of a topic. Um, I often get pitched uh, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about like, from, from freelance journalists here, uh, story, the stories that are kind of like, are more like topics than they are stories. So um, the, the, the freelance journalist will, will write to me and say, would you like something on the future of food or the threat of artificial intelligence or uh, the latest on longevity? And I never, can never really like take those pictures uh, because they, they are, they're just straight topics. They, they just, they're just overviews. They don't go anywhere. They're just, they're, they're, there's no kind of start, middle, and end. I mean, I mean, so what I would take are, in the topic of future food, things like the astonishing growth of meat-free burgers, because that has, that has an arc. You know? That, you know that that story is going to go somewhere because it starts with something that was kind of like a fringe idea moving through kind of like the technical uh, difficulties of doing it through to kind of like people actually eating these meat-free burgers. So, same with like, um, could artificial intelligence develop religion? That's just an intriguing question. You know it's gonna take you somewhere on a journey as, as you look at the, the ways that artificial intelligence might actually acquire uh, uh, faith. And then the final one, uh, the, the woman who plans to live to a thousand years old, this is, this is just an obvious character-based story. You, You'd want to read that to learn about this character and what, what her, her path is. So as I say, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're crafting something and you, and you think it it's, hasn't got that story element yet, it's worth, it's worth kind of like pushing it a little bit further. Um, what, what you get in, in journalism if, with a topic-based overview is something that an old editor of mine used to call a, a list of things feature. So it, it's kind of like, an overview of the future of food might involve talking to three different companies all making kind of like future food and it's and it's here's another thing here's another thing here's another thing there's no there's no narrative art between between those things it's kind of a, just a series of, of kind of things it's just information the um the thing that that has influenced me quite a lot in my in my own writing, um, and, and also in, like, what I try to commission from, from journalists over the past few years is, is the idea that there are story archetypes. And I, I, I find this fascinating, just from a, like a scientific kind of, um, uh, kind of classification point of view. Um, there, there are some people that think there are, basically there are, there are only like six or seven different stories. So like, that, that these things keep getting repeated over and over again. Like the, the classic story is the hero's quest. Um, so, the Lord of the Rings is a great example of that. Um, it, it involves a, somebody on a quest facing difficulties uh, who uh, is, is going to kind of like encounter setbacks but is, is going to get there in the end, battling monsters along the way. Um, I often kind of, um, uh, when, when I'm interviewing somebody uh, trying to tell their story, um, I think of it as what, what is their Gandalf moment? What, what, when did their story begin? So, so, so if I'm interviewing a scientist, I'll ask them, when did you kind of first decide to go on this quest of discovery? Like, what, what was it that inspired you to, to think about this problem? And this, this, the, Gan the Gandalf moment is something that is, is, is it, when you talk to a scientist, 
often you, you kind of like get to, get to the, to the you, spoke, you speak about the end of the process, here is what I discovered. I always think the most interesting part is, is like, where did you begin? So like quests are something that appear all, all the time. And if you can phrase your kind of like your story as a, as a quest, then people, people are, are going to be much more engaged. There are other story shapes as well, though. Um, I mean, like, for example, Tragic Falls, I think, are, are fascinating. I mean, I've, I've written stories like that, which are kind of like the opposite, where, whereas like kind of like there's a quest for discovery. Uh, Tragic Falls are about people with hubris who, who kind of like have got great confidence, uh, who, um, who kind of like fall from grace and often it ends with, with death. So it could, um, in the real world, that can be something like a, the downfall of a company or uh, like political scandals, like, heart, like, uh, like think people that go bust. I mean, th these are all like real life examples of, of um, hubris that where someone went through a, tra a tragic fall. Rags to riches tales appear everywhere. So th this is this, these examples are like inspiring tales of people who over overcame odds like, to acquire wealth. I mean, th th they, they appear time and again. I mean, in fiction, it's, it's things like Aladdin, Oliver Twist. Like, but in real life, it's inspirational tales of, of like, people who've overcome difficulty, like 16-year-old um, students who have found a new way to kind of like, measure polluted water and uh, of kind of like from being a 16 year old kid, they've actually gained widespread acclaim. But these, these are all kind of like stories in real life that you can see happening uh, time and again. And then another kind of like common trope is, is battling the monster. So in, in fiction, like you see it in things like Jaws or um, like ancient tales like Beowulf. So like, but basically Beowulf and Jaws are exactly the same kind of like story in terms of structure. Like Beowulf is a kind of a um, uh, terrorized by a monster uh, outside of a village. I mean, that's basically the same plot as, as Jaws. In nonfiction, this could be a story about like uh, people battling like a massive societal problem, for instance, um, such as cancer or climate change or some other like grand challenge. The, the, I think the key, the key point is, is that these these like narrative tropes, they, they appear in, in lots of different places. And if you, if you can kind of like learn to spot them when, when you see them in real life, you can start to kind of like develop them and learn more about them. I just wanted to, so that, that's, that's kind of my overview of, of stories, but um, I wanted to get a bit more practical now. And if this goes to, to kind of questions, that, that's fine. So. Um, do's and don'ts of story pitching. So the main way that I interact with people who are pitching me is via my email inbox. So uh, this is like a, the practical section of my talk. From a journalist perspective, what are the kind of the, 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 kind of the do's and don'ts in terms of um, uh, kind of reaching out? So I'll start with the don'ts. Uh, so there's, there's Gandalf again. Um, I asked a few, um, I should say before I go into these, like, I asked a few uh, kind of colleagues for their do's and don'ts. What was really interesting to me about that was, was that, that not everybody agreed. Like there was definitely some kind of like some kind of difference between how they want to be kind of like reached out to like in, a, in their email inbox. But here are some of mine. Um, so as I say, I, I, I lose count of the amount of people who send me an attachment and ask me to kind of open it and read it. It's, it's so kind of like so common. Um, you have to kind of like be brief and, and get to the point. It has to be in the email inbox. Um, something that's, that's like, I, it's, it's totally fine if I'm honest, but like it's, also, it's, it's a bit weird, it's like feigning familiarity. Like sometimes like you get, and I get emails that kind of like say, how's the family? Or like, how are you? And it's, it, it just feels a bit weird. It's like, I think, I think like uh, uh, good outreach is about like building real relationships rather than pretending uh, one is there. Um, badly formatted mass email. I always feel sorry for the people who send these out, like, uh, hello, insert email. It happens very commonly. Um, and then finally, like, um, uh, the, something, something that's increasingly common, um, I'm seeing it all the time, is, is, uh, is like using the, the tricks of a freelance journalist to kind of get attention. So I get a lot of emails that say pitch, colon, article pitch, which is kind of like, we'll make, People open it. It makes me open it, but then when I find out it's not an article pitch, it's actually something else. That's it's it's a little bit sneaky. I, I wouldn't 
I'd say you, if you're going to use those tricks to kind of like get people to open your email, just use them, use them rightly. I was so proud of that slide. <laughs> um, took me about an hour, but yeah. Um, so okay, so just some do, some do's. Um, uh, so, I mean, this is really obvious, but like, f find out what we do um, when you're pitching a journalist. Is, is it features or is it news? Like, 90% of what I get is news, but I'm a, a features journalist, so it's, news doesn't really kind of like fit for my publication. So it, it's about like familiarising yourself with uh, the content and audience of the the, the journalist's um, kind of beat. Um, one one thing that this, this this was pointed out to me to me by a colleague. I hadn't really thought about this, but. Um, story context does really help, especially if, you, if you're thinking from a features perspective. Like, it helps us as journalists if you can make the connections between your particular piece of content and what else is happening in the world. You know, it, it just brings us up to speed quickly. I mean, it, most journalists have a, a very shallow awareness of lots of topics, and they don't have the deep awareness that you do of your expertise in, in what you're doing. So just helping, help us make the connections, that always is a good thing. Um, try to get to know the journalists and editors you're contacting. That's, uh, I mean, build a real relationship. That's what it's about. Um, I think if you encounter kind of like journalists who are assholes, just move on. There are, there are nicer journalists out there. I, I, so I've heard kind of like journalists be like really horrible on the phone to people, and just I always think that's just rude. And to an extent, like they're, they're missing out if they, they kind of like are rude to everybody because they'll miss the story that is the good story coming down the track. Um, as I say, be, be intriguing and snappy in your, like, your email subjects and first pass. Keep it, keep it really short. Um, this one's kind of like specific to me in terms of like, I get a lot of emails because I'm kind of like listed as the, the kind of like the managing editor or the editor of my site. Um, I'm not actually that much involved in commissioning. Like it's the, the editors that kind of report into me that do. So it, it might be tempting if you're pitching Wired to kind of. Put, send an email straight to the editor, but he's probably not going to read it uh, because he's thinking about other things. Find out who are the commissioning editors are or the reporters are, rather than finding it, rather than going to like the most senior person you can find on LinkedIn. Uh, multimedia content is always useful, uh, but not if it's attached. And uh, the, the last one was like follow up, like especially with like one to one requests. Like I often miss emails. There's no harm in following up. Um, I, I don't mind a, a quick phone call, but an email is preferable. Um, some journalists hate phone calls and definitely don't want them. So um, I think, uh, but I do, I do think do con do consider following up, especially like if it's something where you've asked um, like one journalist one question. I mean, that's that's I think it's only fair enough that the journalist gets back to you. Okay, that covers everything I was planning to talk about. Thank you. <laughs>